welcome back again. And if you are visiting this space for the first time, you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the gross anatomy of the thalamus. I have done a lecture on the diencephalon, where I describe the thalamus as one of the structural components of the diencephalon. If you've not checked that lecture, please kindly go and view that lecture before you view this. In this lecture, we'll be limiting this to just the gross anatomy of the thalamus, where we'll be unfolding the general structural configuration of the thalamus, the relations of the thalamus, and also its blood supply. The thalamus is the largest structural component of the diencephalon, as we've described in our previous lecture. This is where we have the third ventricle. And if you remember in that lecture, we said that the diencephalon is positioned around the third ventricle. So we have a number of structures located around the third ventricles, and these structures are collected and are so referred to as the diencephalon. So this is where we have the third ventricle here, Harold in dotted black. And around it, we have a number of structures that are taken as the diencephalon. The thalamus is one of these structures. And of course, it is the largest of all these structures. And this is where we have the thalamus here, Herod in green. The thalamus are two in number, which means that we have one on the right and also one on the left. So this is where we have the second thalamus here on the other side. So we have two thalami. So they are two in number. In this image down here, this is where we have the thalamus here, Herod in black. So this is a sagittal view. So this view is only able to show us just one side of the brain where it is seen to capture just one of the thalamus. This structure is paired, as we've stated, it is bilaterally symmetrical. And this means that the structural component of the thalamus on one side is the same as what would be seen as the structural component of the thalamus on the other side. So they are structurally identical, they are bilateral, which means that we have one on one side and we also have another one on the other side. The thalamus is seen to have an egg-shaped configuration. If you look at the configuration of the egg, you see that the egg has a longer anterior-posterior length than the vertical length. So if you look at the transverse length, it is longer than what is presented on the vertical length. And this is why the thalamus tends to present an egg-shaped configuration because of this dimension that it presents. And it is very easy to identify the thalamus in our gross practical classes. If a sagittal section of the brain is taken as this image down here, you see that the, the thalamus stands out in terms of its structural configuration, taking an egg-shaped pattern. So you see this structure here, harrowed in black as the thalamus, and you see it, it is positioned inferior to where we have the corpus callosum. This is the corpus callosum up here, linking the two cerebrum hemispheres together. So if a sagittal section is taken along that plane, this section will be exposing the thalamus of one side. And this is what is harrowed here in black, and this is very easy to identify. So going further on the thalamus, let's describe the specific location of the thalamus. Where is the thalamus specifically located? Remember when we try to describe the position of the diencephalon, we say that there's a number of structures collected together and arranged around the third ventricle. This is where we have the third ventricle here, harrowed in yellow, and around it is where we have the diencephalon. And this is what is captured here in dotted black. So you have a number of structures around it, and these structures are taken as the diencephalon. Above it, we have the cerebrum hemisphere, and inferior to it is where we have the diencephalon. We've also described in our previous lecture on the diencephalon, described the relationship between the cerebrum hemisphere and the diencephalon. And we've also tried to justify the reason why the cerebrum hemisphere is seen to outgrow and also overlap on the diencephalon. This is attributed to the structural growth pattern of the cerebral hemisphere. And this is why it tends to grow over the diencephalon. And that is why you then see the diencephalon being hidden within the cerebral hemisphere. So that is about the diencephalon. But specifically the thalamus, you see that this thalamus has a structural component of the diencephalon. It's located around the posterior part. And this is what is harrowed here in red. So the thalamus is specifically located around the posterior part of the diencephalon, eating deep to the cerebral cortices. This is where we have the cerebral cortex up here. So you see that the thalamus is eating deep 
to where we have the cerebral cortex and also position specifically at the posterior region of the diencephalon. This is the posterior part. This is the anterior part. You can see that this is where we have the cerebellum. The cerebellum is positioned around the posterior region. So this is the posterior part, and this is where the thalamus is specifically located. So using this image down here, this is where we have the thalamus, as we've described also using this image in our previous slide. And this is the anterior part. This is the posterior part. So if you view it from behind, you can see that the thalamus is positioned around the posterior region of the diencephalon. So going further, let's describe the structural component of the thalamus. What is the thalamus structurally made up of? We say that it presents an egg-shaped configuration and you see it has an eminence or a swollen portion that is seen around this space. So what makes it or gives it this swollen configuration and taking an egg-shaped configuration around the space where we have the diencephalon, specifically in the posterior region. The thalamus basically is a mass of gray matter, which of course is made up of a number of nuclei. This mass of gray matter is made up of the neural cell body, and that is why it is grayish in color. And that is why it is so referred to as the gray matter. If we go back to the configuration of the neuron, this is where we have the neuron here, I've also done the lecture on the neuron. If you've not viewed that lecture, or please also kindly go and do so, so as to keep yourself updated, especially in the area of neuroanatomy. So this is the configuration of the neuron. We know that the neuron, we have the neural cell body, which of course is an enlarged part, and extension from the neural cell body, we have the axon. And this is what is harrowed here in blue. In the axon, we have wrap of myelinated sheet. So we have the swan cell wrapping around the axon. It tends to wrap the axon with the myelin sheet. This myelin sheet is whitish in color, and that is why you have a whitish configuration around the region of the brain where you see the running of the axon. And within the brain, these are referred to as tracts. So region where you see collection of axons are referred to as tracts within the central nervous system. And this, of course, will present a whitish color presentation because of the color of the myelin sheets. So if you go to the region where we have the neural cell body, there is no myelin sheet around the space. So this region is seen to present a grayish color and this is why you have the presentation of this coloration around the space where you have collection of neural cell body. So for the thalamus, which of course also means a collection of gray matter. So this collection of neural cell body is what causes the eminence that tends to take an egg-shaped configuration. So we have one neuron here, you have another one. So these neurons, you have group of neural cell body then coming together within this region here that is captured in dotted black, coming together to form an eminence that then take an egg-shaped configuration. So this is what the structural component of the thalamus is made up of. So if you look at this image here, this is where we have the thalamus. If you look at the thalamus, you see that it is made up of a number of nuclei. So this is what the thalamus is structurally made up of. You have a collection of neural cell bodies coming together to form nuclei. So they present a number of nuclei. So this is one of the nuclei. You have another one here, arrowed also in green. So you have a number of nuclei, you know, collected together within the thalamus. Should also note that we have the interthalamic adhesion. Remember when we started this lecture, we said that we have two thalami. We have one on this side and we have another one on the other side. This is where we have the third ventricle that is already in dotted black. And on both sides of the third ventricle around the posterior part, we have the thalamus. We have one on this side and we have another one on the other side. These two thalami are connected together through the interthalamic adhesion. The interthalamic adhesion is a flat band of fibers that is seen to connect the two thalami together on its medial surface. If you look at the configuration of the thalamus, you see that this region on the outside is the lateral wall, while the medial wall will be facing the region where we have the third ventricle. And there is no region where the two thalami will be connecting to each other except on the medial surfaces. So you see the interthalamic adhesion connecting one thalamus to the other 
But the point where this connection occurs is along its medial surface. And this is what is presented in this image here in purple. So you have these fibers running to and fro the thalamus. So connecting it specifically on the medial surface. And of course, this is understandable. If you look at this image down here, we say that this is where we have the thalamus here, arrowed in black. And if you look at this image here, arrowed in red, this is where we have the emergence of the interthalamic adhesion. If you look at this eye spot presentation at this point is where we have the emergence of a flat band that connects the medial wall of one thalamus to the other. And this is referred to as the interthalamic adhesion. So going further, let's look at the general configuration of the thalamus. We said that the thalamus has an egg-shaped configuration. So the thalamus is seen to have two poles, the anterior pole and also the posterior pole. If you look at the configuration here, this is where we have the third ventricle that is already in dotted black. And we say that the posterior part, we have the thalamus that is already in green. If you look at the thalamus, because of its egg-shaped configuration, it has the anterior pole and the posterior pole. Let's say this is where we have the anterior view at the front and posteriorly here we have the posterior view. So the pole that is directed towards the anterior part is the anterior pole. And this is where we have the anterior pole here, arrowed. And this anterior pole, if you look at it, it is related to where we have the interventricular foramen. Remember our interventricular foramen here that is seen to connect the lateral ventricle with the third ventricle. This is where we have the third ventricle and the lateral ventricles are embedded within the two cerebral hemisphere up here. We said that it is a ventricular network and that is why they are connected. So there's a connection between the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle and the foramen that is seen to connect this two ventricles is the interventricular foramen and this structure is positioned or related to the anterior pole of the thalamus this is where we have the anterior pole so we have the interventricular foramen related to the anterior pole of the thalamus going behind we have the posterior pole the posterior pole here is harrowed in blue and it is a pole that is directed towards the posterior part this is where we have the posterior part this is where we have the cerebellum so this pole is directed towards the posterior part. And the structure that is related to it is an expansion of the thalamus itself, which is referred to as the pole vena. If you look at this image here, this is where we have the structural configuration of the thalamus. And this is how it is positioned. This is the anterior part. And behind there is where we have the posterior part. If you look at the posterior region, there's a thickening or an expansion around the posterior part of the thalamus itself. And this region is referred to as the pulvina. This is the pulvina here, harrowed in this portion. Also going further, using this image down here, this is where we have the thalamus here, harrowed in black. This is the anterior view. This is the posterior view. So the anterior pole is directed towards the anterior part as we've described. So this is the anterior pole here, harrowed in yellow. And the posterior pole is behind here that is directed towards the posterior region. So going further, we have four surfaces. We have the superior surface. The superior surface, just as the name implies, is the surface that is positioned above. So losing this image up here, this is where we have the superior surface here, arrowed in purple. This surface is up and is directed superiorly. Also using this image down here, this is where we have the superior surface here above, that is also arrowed here in purple. Then the second surface is the inferior surface. Also, just as the name implies, it is located on the inferior part. Using this image here, this is where we have the inferior surface. Also, this, using this image down here, this is where we have the inferior surface. Then we also have the medial surface. The medial surface is the surface that is directed towards the median plane. Using this image here, this is where we have the medial surface. The medial surface is actually the surface through which we have the emergence of the intertalamic adhesion. So using this image here, remember that this image shows the structural configuration of the thalamus. This surface around this part where we have the emergence of the interthalamic adhesion is where we have the medial surface. So this is the medial surface here, harrowed in blue. And on this surface is where we have the emergence of this adhesion that is seen to connect the medial surface of one thalamus to the other. Then we have the lateral surface. Just as the name also implies, it is the surface that is directed laterally. So those are the four surfaces of the thalamus. And this 
I believe is easy to understand. So going further, what are the functions of the thalamus? We know that the thalamus has a relay station or integration station between the cortical and also the subcortical region. So if you look at the thalamus, this is where we have the thalamus here, Harold, in brain. You can see that above it, we have the cerebrum hemisphere, which is, of course, referred to as the cortical region. Then inferior to it, we have subcortical regions. And this includes different regions of the brainstem and also the cerebellum. This region that is referred to as the thalamus is seen to act as an intercept that connects the cortical region with the subcortical region. Most of the information that are relayed to the cortical region through different pathways are first relayed to the thalamus before they are finally terminated onto the cerebrum hemisphere. The only exception to this is the olfactory pathway, which is responsible for the sense of smell. This pathway is not seen to pass through the thalamus, while the other ones are seen to pass through it before they are finally terminated on the cerebrum hemisphere. And if you look at it, this up here is where we have the cortical region, and below is where we have the subcortical region. So in between these two regions, we have like a gate channel that is referred to as the thalamus, which of course informations will be relayed onto before they are finally terminated onto the final destination point, which is the cerebral cortex. So it's half at an interception point. And if you try to justify the position or the location of the thalamus, you say that the position where it is located also suits the function that it exhibits in terms of being a relay station. The thalamus couldn't have been located in any region of the brain except for this specific region where it will be seen as a gateway that connects the cortical region and also the subcortical region. So you can also use the position or the location to also justify the action that they present in this regard. The other functions of the thalamus include that they also contribute to language arousal, consciousness, sleep, and also emotion. We can also add to this list in the comment section because we have described in our previous slide that the thalamus is made up of a number of nuclei. So this nuclei, of course, they are passageway for different pathways. And these different pathways are to exact different actions. So these actions are also taken as part of the functions of the thalamus. By the time we get to the histology of the thalamus, I will try to look at the different nuclei and also try to justify the functions that they exhibit. In terms of the pathways, we would be able to also add to more of these functions. So now going further on the relations. First, let's look at the anterior relations. This is where we have the thalamus. And of course, we have a number of structures that are located anterior to it. So it's good for us to also unfold these structures. The first one is the interventricular foramen of Monroe. This interventricular foramen of Monroe is what is highlighted here in blue. And you see it's connecting the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. This is where we have the lateral ventricle up here. And this is where we have the third ventricle down here. So you see it has a connection point. And of course, this structure is located anterior to the thalamus. And so we have two interventricular foramina because we have two lateral ventricles. We also try to expatiate more on this during our lecture on the diencephalon. If you look at this image here, this is the corona section of the brain. And different planes of the coronal sections will exhibit or show different structures of the brain. If you look at this smaller image here, if you look at the region where this section is taken, it falls onto the alignment where we have the thalamus. And that is why we're able to see the thalamus in this image. If this section is positioned maybe more anteriorly, the thalamus may not be seen. Because remember we described initially that the position of the thalamus is around the posterior part of the diencephalon. So if this section is directed more anteriorly, we would not be able to see the thalamus. But for you to be able to see the thalamus in coronal section, the pattern or the direction of the plane also matters. So it's good for the plane to fall in alignment to the region where we have the thalamus. So taking the coronal section along this plane, this is the kind of presentation that will be seen and from this presentation, if you look at this structure here that is arrowed in black, this is where we have the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is a thick band of fibers that is seen to connect the two cerebrum hemisphere. I've also done a handmade diagram, and of course, we'll be relating it with this specific presentation. 
you look at this image up here, this where we also have the corpus callosome that is also arrowed here in black. And if you look to the corpus callosome here that is arrowed in blue, we have the fornix. The fornix is a C-shaped band that is located inferior to the corpus callosum. And this is what is arrowed here in blue. So if you look at this image up here, this is where we have the fornix. The fornix is also arrowed in this image. And going back to this structure, between the corpus callosum and the fornix, we have the septum pellucidum. The septum pellucidum is like a tent that tends to separate the two lateral ventricles. Remember, we described the two lateral ventricles as the ventricles that are located within the cerebrum hemisphere. This is where we have one hemisphere. This one we have another hemisphere. And in between it, we have a separation or a demarcation that is created by the septum pellucidum. If you look at this image up here, this is where we have the septum pellucidum here, harrowed in yellow. And of course, on the lateral side, we have the lateral ventricle. So this one lateral ventricle. There's another lateral ventricle on the other side because we say there are two in number of course, located within the cavity of the cerebrum hemisphere. So this is where we have the lateral ventricle. In this image up here, this is where we have the lateral ventricle also arrowed in red. So going further inferiorly using this image, you have the third ventricle. Remember the third ventricle is located inferior to the lateral ventricle. So this is what is arrowed here in blue. If you go up here to this image, this is where we have the third ventricle arrowed here in black. So you can see that this configuration here is also presented in this handmade diagram. And of course we know that on both sides of the third ventricle, we have the thalamus. This means this is where we have the thalamus here arrowed in green. In this image up here, this is where we also have the thalamus here arrowed in green. Because during examination, we would be using handmade diagrams to make illustrations. And that is why I've tried to relate these to handmade diagrams. So this is the configuration of the coronal section of the brain. And of course, the alignment is taken where we have the position of the thalamus. So that we would be able to see the thalamus. This specific region here that is harrowed here in dotted purple in the anterior part is where we have the opening of the interventricular foramen. And this is what is also seen in this handmade diagram here, also harrowed in dotted purple. This is where we have the interventricular foramen connecting one lateral ventricle with the third ventricle. This interventricular foramen, we say they are two in number just because we have two lateral ventricles. So you have another one also on the other side. Further on the structures that are located anterior to the thalamus, we also have the internal cerebral vein. And of course, the internal cerebral vein will also be located in the anterior part as shown in this corona section of the brain. Also using this handmade diagram, this is where we have the internal cerebral vein here, yeah, also arrowed in dotted purple. So these structures are located anterior to the thalamus. Also, if you look further, using this image down here, this is where we say we have the thalamus. And anterior to it, although positioned more inferiorly, is where we have the hypothalamus. And this is what is also arrowed here in black. If you want to take it as part of the anterior relations of the thalamus, it should be specifically stated that it's located in the anterior inferior part of the thalamus. So going further on the posterior relation, the posterior relations are structures that are located behind the thalamus. So using this image down here, this is where we have the thalamus here, harrowed in black. So we have a number of structures that are located posterior to the thalamus. And this is what this slide will be unfolding. I remember when we tried to describe the poles of the thalamus, we said that the poles of the thalamus are two in number. We have the anterior pole and we have the posterior pole. We said that the posterior pole, around this space, there is a thickening and enlargement that is referred to as the pole vena. So this is the pole vena here, harrowed in black. This is like a structural component also of the thalamus, but of course, thanks to distinct itself due to the enlargement that it presents. And this is referred to as the pole vena. So it's good for us to highlight this before we go further to the structures that are related posterior to it. So on the posterior side, Using this handmade image also, this is where we have the thalamus here, harrowed, and you see that the thalamus, of course, is embedded within the cerebrum hemisphere. So if you look at it, this is the anterior configuration, this is the posterior configuration. If you look at this image, you see that we have a number of structures that are related to the thalamus. Posteriorly, the first structure is the tri-terminalis. 
The striped Amelandes is a band of white matter that is seen to extend from the hypothalamus in the anterior part to the amygdala posteriorly. So if you look at it, this is where we have the striped terminalis. You can see these fibers running, highlighted in black. The essence of the connection between the amygdala and the hypothalamus is to create a stimulation signal because the amygdala is a center or the hub for emotion. And it does this through the connection that it forms with the hypothalamus through the striped terminalis. And what happens is that the amygdala will stimulate the hypothalamus where signals will then be sent to the adrenal gland for it to secrete adrenaline or epinephrine. And these, of course, are needed in, in the management of emotion. So this connection is like a mini network that is created for the control of emotion through the process of the amygdala stimulating the hypothalamus to signal the adrenal gland to secrete the emergency hormone. So this is where we have the hypothalamus here at the front. Remember we said that the hypothalamus is located anteriorly, but on the inferior side of the thalamus. So you have it here and you see the striped terminal is connected and being directed posteriorly until when it gets inserted on the amygdala. So this connection, of course, is created to control emotion. Then the second structure is the choroid plexus, but specifically the choroid plexus of the third ventricle. Remember that the third ventricle is somewhere around this region. So this is where we have the choroid plexus here, harrowed, and of course it's seen as a posterior relation of the thalamus. We also have the phonics. The phonics, we say that is a C-shaped band that is seen as an outflow of the hippocampus. This is where we have the phonics here, harrowed, and this alignment is seen at the posterior part of the thalamus. This is where we have the thalamus, and you see it running like that. But specifically, it is the body region of the phonics that is seen to be positioned at the posterior part of the thalamus. If you look at this image up here, this is where we have the anterior part. This is where we have the posterior part. This is where we have the cerebellum. And if you look at this region here that is harrowed, this is where we have the thalamus. And if you look at it at the posterior part, the arrow in red, this is where we have the body of the phonix. So you see that the body of the phonix is posteriorly related to the thalamus. Another structure that we see is the corpus callosum. The specific region of the corpus callosum that is seen to relate to the posterior part of the thalamus is the splenium. So using this image down here, this is where we have the splenum here, arrowed in blue. We know that the corpus callosum has the splenum, it has the isthmus, it has the body, it has the genome, and it has the rostrum. So these are the sub-regions of the corpus callosum, but specifically it is the splenum, which is the most posterior region of the corpus callosum that is seen as a posterior relation of the thalamus, and this is understandable. So using this image up here, this is where we have the splenium of the corpus callosum that is also arrowed here in blue. You can see that it is seen at the posterior part of the thalamus. Then the next structure is the caudate nucleus. This is the caudate nucleus here, arrowed in green. The caudate nucleus is made up of the head, the body, and also the tail. So all other regions apart from the head is what is related posteriorly to the thalamus. You can see that the head region is located in the anterior part and it is specifically located in the anterior lateral part, but the region of the caudate nucleus that is seen to be positioned around the posterior part of the thalamus is the body and also the tail. And this is what is harrowed here in green. We also have the internal cerebral vein. Remember we described the internal cerebral vein when we tried to describe the structures that are related anterior to the thalamus. We say that the internal cerebral vein is also located in the anterior part. So you also see this vein also extending behind, and this also forms the posterior relation of the thalamus. Then also we have the pineal gland and the abenular nuclei. So using this image here, this is where we have the thalamus here, harrowed in black. And of course, we say that the posterior part, we have a number of structures that are referred to as the epithalamus. This we described in our previous lecture on the diencephalon. And this ball-shaped structure 
is referred to as the penile gland or the penile body. And this is seen also to be located behind the thalamus. And we also have the abenula nuclei and also the abenula commissure also positioned at the posterior part of the thalamus. So it's good for us to be able to highlight the different structures that are seen or positioned around the posterior part of the thalamus. Let's look at the structure that is related to the thalamus medially. This should come easy. We know that the thalamus is located on both sides of the third ventricle. We should know by now that medially the thalamus will be related to the lateral wall of the third ventricle. This is where we have the third ventricle. So this is the third ventricle here, harrowed in red. So the lateral wall of this third ventricle will be related medially to the thalamus. So this is where we have the thalamus here, harrowed. And of course, the lateral wall of the ventricle is what is seen to be related to the medial wall of the thalamus. And this, of course, is understandable. So using this image here, this is where we have the third ventricle. And on both sides is where we have the thalamus. So this is one thalamus and this is one thalamus. So we have two thalamus here located on both sides of the third ventricle that is already in red. So you see that the lateral wall of the third ventricle is what is actually related to the medial wall of the thalamus. So going further, we have the interthalamic adhesion. The interthalamic adhesion, we already stated this, there is an emergence that is seen on the medial wall of the thalamus. And of course, it is through this adhesion that one thalamus connects with the other. So using this image up here, this is where we have the interthalamic adhesion. And of course, it's specifically seen on the medial wall or the medial surface of the thalamus because it is through this surface that these connections are created. Using this image up here, this is where we have the thalamus. And of course, because this is a sagittal section taken along the midline, if you look at it, the surface that will be exposed in this image up here will be the medial surface. And this is where we have this emergence arrowed here, which of course is for the attachment of the interthalamic adhesion which will be connecting one medial surface of the thalamus with the medial surface of the other thalamus. So going laterally, the structure that will be seen laterally is the internal capsule. We have the internal capsule that is seen as a V-shaped tract running from the cerebral hemisphere to the brain stem. So using this image up here, this is a handmade diagram. This is where we have the thalamus here, Harold. And on the lateral side is where we have the internal capsule. You can see the internal capsule running from the cerebral hemisphere up here. And of course, being directed downwards. And this structure is seen to be positioned on the lateral side of the thalamus. If you use this image down here, this is where we have the thalamus here, harrowed in black. And if you look at it on its lateral side, you have the internal capsule. So you have one on this side, harrowed in blue, and you have another one on the other side, arrowed in blue. Also using this image to establish specifically, because the internal capsule also is divided into sub-regions, we have the anterior limb, we have the genome, and we have the posterior limb. So specifically, it is the posterior limb that is seen to form alignment laterally to the thalamus. So if you look at this, this is where we have the thalamus here. And if you look at this limb at the back, it is actually the posterior limb of the internal capsule that is seen on the lateral side of the thalamus. So the structure that we see above are the two lateral ventricles. This is where we have the thalamus here, arrowed in black. And above it, we have the lateral ventricles here, arrowed in white. So this is the structure that you tend to see above the thalamus. Then inferiorly, the structure that we see inferiorly is the geniculate bodies. If you try and use this image here, this is the medial surface, this is the lateral surface. This is where we have the posterior pole and the anterior pole. If you look at the posterior pole on the inferior side, we have the emergence of the geniculate body. So we have the medial geniculate body and we have the lateral geniculate body. As we have on this thalamus, we also have on the other thalamus. So these geniculate bodies are seen as an inferior rounded bulge from the posterior inferior part of the thalamus. So they are taken as part of the structures that are related inferiorly to the thalamus. And remember when we try to describe the, the encephalon, we describe these structures as the metathalamus. So also going further, we have the hypothalamus. To use this image up here, this is where we have the thalamus here, arrowed in black. And inferiorly to it is where we have the hypothalamus, although 
position the bit more anterior. So the hypothalamus is located in the anterior inferior part of the thalamus. Then we have the cerebral aqueduct of sylvius. This cerebral aqueduct of sylvius is seen to run through the midbrain. If you look at this image here, this is where we have the cerebral aqueduct of sylvius here, arrowed in purple. It is through this cerebral aqueduct of sylvius that the third ventricle connects with the fourth ventricle because we say that they are ventricular network. So these ventricles need to be connected. And of course, the connection point between the third and the fourth ventricle is through the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. And this alignment runs through the midbrain. And if you see it here, it is also seen to be located inferior to the thalamus. This is where we have the thalamus here, harrowed in black. And inferiorly here, where we have cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius harrowed in purple is located inferior to it. So if you look at this handmade image here, you see that this is where we have the third ventricle arrowed in red. And inferiorly here is where we have the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius connecting the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle that is arrowed here in black. So there is actually a connection point between these two ventricles and the connection point is through the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. And if you look at the pattern of this cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius, you see that it runs through the midbrain. This is where we have the midbrain. So it runs through this region before it finally opens into the fourth ventricle. And of course, it is seen to be located inferior to the thalamus. This is where we have the thalamus here. And of course, taken as part of the structures that are located inferior to it. And the next structure is the midbrain. If you look at this image up here, this is where we have the midbrain. Remember when we described the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius, we said that it passed through the midbrain. So the midbrain itself is part of the structures that are located inferior to the thalamus, but specifically is the tegmentum of the midbrain. When we get to the midbrain, we see where this specific region is located. So it is the tegmentum that actually aligns with the inferior part of the thalamus. So also going back to this image, which is where we have the midbrain that is also arrowed here in blue. So the midbrain, of course, is seen to be positioned inferior to the thalamus. But specifically, we say that it is the tegmentum of the midbrain that is seen at the inferior part of the thalamus. So now going to the blood supply. The blood supply of the thalamus is through the posterior cerebral artery. So we have branches emerging from the posterior cerebral artery, giving branches to supply the thalamus. So this is where we have the thalamus here arrowed in red. And if we take a deep look again, we see that this thalamus is located around the posterior part. So whatever vessel that will be giving supply to it, of course, we emerge from the posterior region. And that is why we have branches from the posterior cerebral artery, giving branches to supply the thalamus. But going back to how we have the emergence of the posterior cerebral artery, remember we have a subclavian here that is highlighted in red. The subclavian is from the hack of aorta. It also has variation on both the right side and the left side. But on the left side, it is a direct emergence from the hack of aorta, while on the right side, it emerges from the brachiocephalic trunk. So we have the brachiocephalic trunk emerging from the hack of aorta, which then further divides into the subclavian and also the common carotid. At the end, we still have the emergence of the subclavian, either directly from the hack or indirectly from the hack. So we have the subclavian here from the subclavian. We have a number of branches. The subclavian ordinarily is supposed to be directed towards the upper limb region where it gives branches to supply that region. But it also gives branches that goes off to supply the structures within the head and neck region. So we have the emergence of the vertebral artery from the subclavian as one of the branches that are directed upward. So this is the vertebral artery here that is harrowed in red. The vertebral artery on one side, we also have the emergence of the vertebral artery on the other side. The two vertebral arteries we then unite from the basilar artery. And this is where we have the basilar artery here. From the basilar artery, we now have further subdivision into the posterior cerebral arteries. So we have one on this side. We also have another one on the other side. So it's from this posterior cerebral artery that we have the emergence of branches that will supply the thalamus. And also remember that because the thalamus is positioned around the posterior part, of course, we'll be receiving branches from these posterior branches of the cerebral artery. Then it also has contributory branches from the posterior communicating artery. 
The posterior communicating artery emerges from the internal carotid artery. And this is the internal carotid artery. So from the internal carotid artery, we have the branch that emerges, and this is the posterior communicating artery. This posterior communicating artery also gives supporting branches to supply the thalamus. So this is how the thalamus is supplied from different branches from the posterior cerebral artery and also receiving support from the posterior communicating artery. So thanks for watching this video. Let's continue to stay glued to this channel.